So hi, everybody. And thank you, Sung. Thank you, Jeannie, for having me here at this webinar. I um, just heard uh, Dr. O saying how hard it is to just limit your talk to <laughs> 30 minutes. So I'm going to do my best. Um, I usually get to talk very fast for an hour about Korean art. So today I'm going to be talking as fast as I can for 20 minutes or so. Um, I, uh, it's, a, it's always a great honor to come and speak to the teachers who are out there promoting uh, Korean culture and art and, uh, and everything about Korea to their students. So it's, um, it's wonderful to be, to be here, to be sharing some of the highlights of Korean art with you all. Um, I, I, I think that Jeannie has probably shared with you the top 10 that I put together for a video, my top 10 treasures of Korean art. Um, here's a quick sort of recap of what I are here on this screen. That's a, that's a nice short video of me racing through 15 centuries of Korean art um, in, in just 10 images. Today I'll be doing it in 20 images. Um, I'm not gonna be using the same images and I'm gonna be touching on some different aspects of Korean art. Um, so, here we go. Um, the first, I think you've all already had some background in Korean history, but I will try and recap whenever it seems necessary um, some of the dates for you because it's it, it's a lot to, to digest. Um, my my one of my main goals in this in this lecture um, every year is to to show how, how very rich and unique Korean art history is. For a long time, uh, scholars in the West have thought that Korean art was merely derivative of Chinese art. And so one of, the, one of my goals in this presentation is to show um, where there is Chinese influence, but where uh, the Koreans have, have either received influence from other cultural um, backgrounds such as the sort of nomadic cultures of Northern Asia, but also uh, to show what is uniquely Korean and then what has gone on to influence other neighboring cultures like Japan in particular. So where I'm starting here with a couple of images from the Three Kingdoms period um, and that it, hopefully you all remember that's from roughly the first century BC to 668 AD and when the Korean Peninsula was divided into Koguryo in the north, Pekji in the southwest, and Shilla in the southeast. And these two images are from, of objects from tombs from Shilla, from the Shilla kingdom, and they date to the fifth, sixth century AD. These are both um, objects that are in the Metropolitan Museum's collection here in the US. And I'm starting with these gorgeous earrings because these are something that I've, I, I wish I had a pair of these myself. <laughs> if I could have one, uh, one object from today's talk, it would be these earrings. Um, they are uh, a wonderful example of the type of burial treasures that have been ex ex excavated from the Shilla tombs. Now Shilla, the, the Shilla people are known to have descended from North Asian nomadic peoples and their rulers were shamans and performed shamanistic rituals that are very similar to the, the types of rituals uh, that connected the human living, the, the realm of the living and the spirit realm in many um, nomadic cultures throughout Asia and far west. Their capital was uh, known as Kumsang, and that's where the modern day city of Kyungju is now. And uh, Kumsang means the city of gold. And many of the objects found in, Kore in the Shilla tombs are related to have um, some relationship with the shamanistic rituals of the Shilla rulers and also um, are made out of gold. It shows how much wealth, how much. Uh, gold the Shilla rulers had access to. And these earrings show, um, these gorgeous earrings show the fine craftsmanship that the Shilla rulers had at their beck and call. Um, so there's some aspects of the earrings are, they show very simple hammering on sheets of gold, but there are also very fine uh, examples of a technique called granulation, which is a technique that is, uh, uses tiny little beads of gold and they're adhered to the surface. So a very complex technique that helps to create patterning. 
So um, on the right here, we have an example of very early Korean ceramic, so 5th, 6th century burial ceramic, which is very typical of the type of ceramic that was made during the Three Kingdoms period. And it is very um, technologically advanced compared with many other parts of the world. The, the pieces are fa fired, they're thrown on a wheel and they're fired at very high temperatures. Um, and these are two tech technologies that weren't available to a lot of other cultures at the time. And what's really remarkable and unique about these ceramics is that they are, are not glazed, unlike their Chinese counterparts from this period, they don't have any glaze. And they also often have pedestals, these sort of tall foot, a, a tall foot uh, that is, are perforated. And you, they either have triangular perforations or these square perf perforations here. And something that's very interesting to note from an art historical and cultural point of view is that similar pieces to these have been found in the imperial tombs of Japan, which suggests to many people, not, not always to, to Japanese people, that it's, it's possible that the, the Japanese imperial family had Korean roots. There's a very controversial topic, uh, both in Korea and Japan. Okay, my next slide. Uh, oh goodness, here we go. Sorry. And another um, tomb in Kyongju is known as the, the Tomb of the Heavenly Horse. And it's named after this painting here that um, is one of the earliest surviving Korean paintings. And it is on a birch bark saddle flap, a saddle flap that would have been um, used on a horse. And it is a, a very interesting piece in part because it shows us the importance of horses to the Shilla people. And if you think of them as being descended from nomadic peoples from Northern Asia, then it's not surprising that the horse would have been important to them in their daily lives as nomadic herdsmen and travelers. Now, it, it seems that because of the presence of this image of a flying horse in a, a burial site, that the horse was also considered important in the afterlife. And this is a belief that is not unique to Shilla. It's actually something that you see in a lot of contemporary Chinese tombs suggests, and you see there's a, I've included an image of a, a Han Dynasty bronze flying horse from around about a little bit earlier than, than this tomb to show you um, a comparison from China. It's, uh, the horse was considered to be a vehicle that could help transport the soul to paradise in China and possibly in Shilla as well. Now, the presence of the, the painting of the flying horse and also of some other very exotic foreign objects in the, the tomb of the heavenly horse um, uh, makes some very interesting um, um, it's to make it very like, seem very likely that, that Shilla at the very southeastern part of the Korean Peninsula was actually connected to China and the Western world as part of the Silk Road. The, the small blue cup that comes from that tomb is from Syria. And the idea of a Syrian glass cup being found in a Korean tomb from the 5th, 6th century AD seems to suggest that um, the, the presence of that cup in the tomb suggests that this was a treasure. It had been brought into, into the Shilla kingdom along the Silk Road, which is a very important point as far as um, the idea of um, connectivity at an early date is concerned. Now, um, Buddhism is a faith that entered into the Korean Peninsula in the fourth century AD. Prior to that, most it's believed that the 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 pervasive uh, native traditions were shamanism or some, some uh, type of shamanistic practice. Now, um, when Buddhism entered into to Korea, it came in from China. Monks and priests carried in texts and images from China, uh, first through Koguryo and Pekchi, and finally to Shilla. Now, what we're looking at here is a sculpture of a Buddhist deity, specifically Maitreya, who is a bodhisattva or a compassionate being who postpones his own enlightenment to stay in this world and save other people. Specifically, he is uh, Maitreya, the, but, uh, the future Buddha. He is a bodhisattva who's destined to become the next Buddha in the world. And he's shown in this very contemplative pose 
uh, because he is sitting in his heaven looking down at us trying to decide if now is the best time to come. And I think a lot of us would probably agree we need him to show up sometime pretty soon uh, to help us through some of these hard times. And it's very, um, it has been common that at periods of, of, of unrest, people um, in Buddhist cultures have looked to Maitreya, um, to the second coming as it were, um, in the hope that he will come and rescue us. Now, he's an, this is a very important sculpture because some of the earliest Korean Buddhist sculptures were heavily influenced by Chinese um, style. And you see a little bit of that in his robes. You see the beautiful lines that um, uh, mark the, the folds of, his, of the cloth of his robes. But what's really wonderful about this image is that he has a very uniquely Korean face. His cheek, high cheekbones, his broad, uh, his broad face, his very his long nose, um, are very Korean features, and these are something that we're seeing now in the seventh century in this in this beautiful piece that we we believe is from the Shilla Kingdom, and um, either the very, very late part of the Shilla Three Kingdoms period or the early part of the Unified Shilla period. The piece I'm showing next to him on the right is a very similar um, Buddhist sculpture in a temple in Japan, carved by Korean Buddhist sculptors who helped to spread Buddhism to Japan. Okay, sorry, I keep forgetting how to forward here. All right, so more famous probably than the image of Maitreya is this very powerful image of the Buddha. Um, he is the Buddha of Sokuram, the stone cave hermitage near Kyongju. And he is, he is probably the most famous Korean Buddhist image. He is a, a powerful seated Buddha. Uh, he sits in a cave temple that was constructed in the unified Shilla period. And this is the, the unified Shilla period extended from 668 AD through 935 AD. And it was a time when the kingdom of Shilla um, unified the peninsula with the help of Tang China, a very powerful Chinese empire. And not surprisingly, uh, the whole peninsula was heavily influenced by Tang Chinese um, culture and also religion. And here we see a very Tang Chinese style Buddha. Um, and some of these features can be seen in a, at the Tang Ch the Chinese Buddha up in the, in the upper right, a, a Buddha carved in stone into a cliff face in Luoyang, Luoyang in China. Um, you see a very, a very fleshy face and very, um, very fine folds and, and fine drapery. Um, and you see a similar Japanese image down at the bottom right of, of a plaque that dates to the eighth century, also influenced by Tang Chinese Buddhist style. So this is the Tang international style of depicting Buddhas. They're very heavy set, chunky. They often have quite stern facial expressions and they often have three folds in their, on their neckline. Um, it's supposed to be a sign of advanced wisdom. So as I get older, I will, I will, <laughs> I will call those various folds um, a sign of advanced wisdom. Now, the... Um, a Sokuram Buddha was built by a very powerful minister, Kim Tae-sung, um, to show his embracing of, of Buddhism and also his power. He was connecting his own power with the power of the Buddha. And he, um, not only was he influenced by Chinese Buddhist traditions, but also by Buddhist traditions in India and Central Asia, where um, it was very common to build cave temples. Um, here's a line drawing of the Sokaram cave temple that has, it has a square anteroom and then a domed, a round domed chamber where the Buddha sits. Um, I'm showing you for comparison, image of an Indian cave temple at Ajanta to show where this tradition originated. Now here you see the Sokaram Buddha sitting in the round chamber, the main chamber of the Sokaram cave temple. And he, although he is very much, his, his sculptural style is very much influenced by Tang China, there is much about his, his iconography that is unique to, to Korea and also to this particular temple. He is, has his hand reaching over his right leg, which suggests that he's the historical Buddha of um, 
Lord, who is at the moment of attaining enlighten enlightenment and asking the earth to witness his enlightenment and his resolve. Um, normally, that Buddha isn't surrounded by a lot of um, statues of priests and other deities. He's usually shown alone. So the fact that this, um, the that in this Korean eighth century cave temple, he's surrounded by other deities makes him very unique and very unusual. And there's a lot of argument among art historians as to what who he actually represents, whether he represents the historical Buddha or perhaps um, Amida Buddha, another Buddha or a cosmic Buddha. Um, the, the jury's still out on who he represents, but he's very unique and very interesting. And he's made out of granite and very large. And I've never been able to get inside that. You can't get inside the chamber to get close to him and, and walk around him as a, the early followers of the, the Buddha would have. Now, um, the next period in Korean history is the Goryeo dynasty, Goryeo period, which extends from 935 to 1392. And this is another golden age of Buddhism in Korea when the ruling classes embraced Buddhism and um, Buddhist temples were, were patronized by the wealthy. And so there was a, a, the arts and Buddhist arts in particular flourished during this period. This is, uh, these are a couple of examples of beautiful Buddhist paintings on silk um, from this period. The left, the painting on the left is from the Musée Guimet in Paris. The one on the right is from the Freer Gallery in in Washington DC. And they are paintings that were originally thought to be Chinese until a Korean um, art historian examined them a few years ago and discovered that they were painted on both the front and the back of the silk, which was a, a technique that was unique to Korea during this period. So she was able to claim them as Korean and this has really um, helped uh, research into these paintings um, in collections around the world. It's a very um, beautiful, elegant painting of another bodhisattva, Guanam, who is considered to be the most compassionate of all the Buddhist deities. Very elegantly rendered here on silk. Now, also during the, the Goryeo period, the Koreans um, contributed one of the finest types of ceramics to, to um, the art of the world. And this is a type of ceramic called a celadon. Now, celadons are basically usually stoneware ceramics, so they're made, they're not porcelain, but they are coated with this beautiful pale green glaze that derives its color from uh, small quantities of iron oxide in the mixture. And they're fired in a, in a kiln that doesn't have very much oxygen in it so that the, the iron oxide turns this cool green tone. This is a type of ceramic that was actually invented in China, but many people argue that the Koreans perfected the, the shade of green. And they also added this layer of decoration to their celadons that has not been, is not seen in any other, in other, any other cultures that have created celadons. This is a type of decoration called inlay, and it is done by carving designs into the clay when it's still leather hard, and then uh, filling those little grooves with black and white slip, which is a liquid clay, basically, and then coating the whole vessel with celadon glaze so that the black and white designs basically shine through the glaze. It's a very striking, very unique and beautiful type of ceramic. And this type of ceramic, these beautiful, luxurious green glazed wares were, were commissioned by the Bud Buddhist temples at a lot of money and also by the royal court. And this is a beautiful ewer in the shape of a melon from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, now in the Joseon dynasty, which began in 1392 and extended through to um, well, it depends on <laughs> the dates you find in, in when you, you look, but 18, I think 1897 or 1911 are both given as end dates for the Joseon dynasty. Um, the whole aesthetic of ceramics shifted, uh, and this is in part because um, the whole, the spirituality of Korea and of the ruling classes underwent a shift. This was a period when Buddhism fell out of favor and Confucianism, or rather Neo-Confucianism, a form of 
the Chinese um, philosophical system, which is called Confucianism after the philosopher um, Confucius, who lived around the third, um, about 2,500 years ago, basically. Um, he emphasized the importance of education, the importance of honoring your parents and of austerity and humility. And these are all values that were very much embraced by the upper classes during the Joseon dynasty. And you see these values re reflected in a lot of the arts um, of this period. And where you see it, um, these philosophies reflected the most, I would argue, is in the ceramics. So we go from the Koryo dynasty when we have these gorgeous um, green, shiny ceramics with, with elegant designs, um, inlaid designs that are very meticulous and, and detailed to some of the, the simplest ceramics uh, you'll see in any culture. Like the, at the top right here, you see uh, a pale white moon vase. And these were some of the most highly prized ceramics. They've gone for sale in auctions in recent years for millions of dollars, um, as they are still highly prized in Korea. But they're basically pure white porcelain, um, and they are valued for the purity and the austerity, the simplicity of the 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 shape and the color. And the porcelain was made in Korea and the first made around about the 12th century, but it, but it was made in larger numbers around the 15th century once, the, um, once this style, this type of ceramic had really been um, embraced and admired by the upper classes. And they, I, I can't remember the date of this pure white moon vase, but to the right here is another Korean porcelain that I think is, gives you a good idea of the aesthetic that was embraced by the upper classes. Um, it's a very simple um, design of autumn grasses painted in very pale cobalt blue on the surface of the porcelain. And um, this type of uh, vase would have been used in a scholar's studio, a young Ban scholar's studio, um, and would have represented some of the ideals of the scholarly gentleman who, who embraced Confucian pr principles of austerity, humility, and filial piety honoring the ancestors and he would have been inspired um, to paint um, uh, ink painting write poetry uh, and study the classics perhaps by looking at a, a beautiful vase like this now i'm showing a couple of images of porcelains from china and japan at the bottom here just for comparison of the the approach to design of porcelains interestingly to me um, the, the Koreans never exported their porcelains. They kept them to, their, to themselves, whereas the Chinese are very famous for exporting porcelain. And then from the 17th century onwards, the Japanese exported their porcelain too. But there's very, very little Korean porcelain left Korea. May your two minute warning. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so here we, Oh my goodness, sorry. Um, Punchong ware is another type of ceramic that became very popular. This was what the, the, the lower class people um, uh, used because they couldn't afford the porcelain. So they covered their, their um, sort of brown looking pots with this white slip. Um, and these are my favorites, but I will skip through because I, <laughs> I, I don't have time to, to, I could give a whole lecture on this pot. Um, this is, uh, there are many different painting styles in the Chosun dy uh, dynasty, and this is uh, one that is very unique to Korea, a Chekgori screen. This is an eight, full, eight panel screen decorated with images from a scholar's studio, and these were meant to represent those scholarly ideals that the Yangban scholarly class embraced. So they might um, place a screen like this um, behind their desk as they sat and, and did their the writing or reading or painting or poetry composition. I love these screens. This is from Scripps College's collection. And uh, a fabulous wedding robe. Uh, this would have been a princess's wedding robe. This is a reproduction in the um, National Museum. Um, and it, it's just to show the, the wealth of auspicious symbols and the bold colors you see in a lot of Korean textiles. Um, made by women, we never know the names of the women who made these but I needed to, needed to 
throw one in here just so that you know that women were a big part of the artistic output in Korea over the centuries. I'm going to skip through this. Is this is a, a palace, the um, Gyeongbuk Palace in Seoul. I will run through this. Uh, this is the main hall. It looks like a two-story building from the outside, but is actually a single story inside. Um, here's a little guy who's at the base of one of the, the steps leading up into the main hall, who's a, probably a zodiac creature. I just loved him. He's I've, I've never seen another uh, creature who looks quite like him. Um, this is the, the far-reaching fragrance pavilion on the grounds of the Gyobok um, Palace as well. And the, this wonderful, this is the highlight of the, the palace complex for me because this is um, a chimney here that it, it's to basically, um, for the ondol to, to basically heat the floors of the palace and it's decorated with this beautiful, um, almost like a screen painting of auspicious creatures and motifs. Um, this is very uniquely Korean. Even though palace designs were loosely based on Chinese architectural principles, they were very, they were, they had uniquely Korean as, um, parts and details as well. I'm going to end on a couple of contemporary pieces. This is a terribly blurry slide, I'm sorry, of uh, a porcelain, um, a, large, a contemporary porcelain um, installation by um, Kim Yi-gyung, she showed her work at UCLA in 2010, 10 years ago now, and this is just to remind you of the auster austerity, in this, which is one of, the, one of the aesthetic trends throughout Korean art. On the other hand, there's a very colorful, um, colorful um, aesthetic at work in much of Korean art, and this is a piece called Happy Happy by um, Choi Jung-hwa that was exhibited at LACMA in 2009. And it just, it was a really happy, happy piece and made out of plastic containers from the 99 cent store. And people loved interacting with this piece. And I'm just um, gonna show you this um, piece of calligraphy because calligraphy is an important um, art form in East Asia. And it, it hasn't been um, valued um, as highly uh, in Korea as it has been in China and Japan for for a while but there's a, a wonderful exhibition that's on right now at the Doksu Palace Museum in Seoul that is celebrating this art form. It's the first exhibition of its kind in that national museum and apparently even though it opened in March and they can't show it to anybody in person they have put an, on, a, an online tour of the exhibition up on YouTube and it apparently has had something like 29,000 visits. So it's wonderful that um, that exhibitions like this can be seen online now and all of us in the art world are working on, <laughs> we're and in the museum world are trying to, to find ways of, of showing um, the art um, that are safe and enjoyable to people around the world. So thank you so much. I'm sorry I, I overran. It, it is really, really hard to, to summarize 1500 <laughs> years of art in 20 minutes. Thank you so much, Ms. McCarthy. Um, okay. And I don't, is there time for any questions at all or, or do we have? Sorry, I don't think so. There are questions. Can I send you, you can, the questions? Absolutely. And if, if anybody wants to contact me with questions about Korean art, um, I'm happy for them to email me. So you can okay. share my email address too, Jeannie. Thank you. Thank you, Song. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank <laughs> and, you. Uh, okay. And, Okay. Enjoy, enjoy your enjoy. Korean culture adventure this week. Bye-bye. Okay, Thank bye. you.